Okay, we will get started. Uh, we have been talking about sequential quadratic programming. And the idea here is I have a problem I want to minimize. So this is just a recap. This is the problem I want to solve. I then convert it into an unconstrained minimization problem. Where C has to be greater than summation mu j star j goes from 1 to r and your p of x is max of 0 g1 x gr x now the problem that we faced in the previous class was well it's a non differentiable function so how am i going to uh, come up with a descent direction because I cannot differentiate this function and so the idea then was I'm going to iteratively solve the following optimization problem C and R well I should just like C greater than equal to 0 gradient of f x k transpose t plus half for all this. So that was dk and then my xk plus 1 will be xk plus alpha k dk. Okay, so this was the train of thought in the previous class, starting from a inequality constrained minimization problem. And even if you have equality constraint, you can convert it to inequality constraint. So you, you start with this problem, you come up with a penalty function for which uh, under the condition that C is greater than this sum of Lagrange multipliers, then the optimal solution to this is also an optimal solution to this problem. Now, I have this uh, non-differentiable function. I cannot do the usual gradient descent. So I will do the gradient descent, like I will try to do the gradient descent using, by solving a sequence of quadratic programs uh, and, and then pick alpha k according to some rule that we will talk about today and proceed. And this entire process is known as sequential quadratic program. Very powerful algorithm. And if you are going to do optimization in embedded systems, uh, this would be one of the first algorithms that you would be trying to solve. <coughs> okay. So now there are a few open questions here. Okay. What are the open questions? I'm standing at x naught and I want to compute d naught which is the di descent direction but I don't know a few things so I don't know what value of c I need to pick so I know from theory that c has to be larger than sum of mu j star but I don't know what the sum of mu j star looks like so I don't know the value of c and if I don't know the value of c I cannot really run this optimization problem because one of the term is kind of unknown. 
So that's problem number one. How do you compute the value of C? Problem number two, how do you compute alpha K? Like, how should we design, design the value of alpha K so that we can do the descent and proceed? We, we, are, we are moving in a direction where the value of function is reducing. So that's the second question. And then the third question is, what about HK? Like, how do I pick HK? Is there a better way to compute HK? So those are the questions that we will worry about today. And then we'll talk about Lagrangian methods, which is a whole new class of algorithms for solving optimization problems. Any questions so far? How would you solve this optimization problem? Assuming you know the value of C, how would you solve it? Well, you can use manifold suboptimization method to solve this problem. So not that complicated. You already have the code written for that, so you don't have to worry about it. OK. So let's talk about how do you pick alpha k. So pick alpha k according to the first is minimization rule. The second is limited minimization rule. And the third is Armijo's rule. And if you pick alpha k according to these rules, your xk is, well, this is the result. This is the theorem. So if uh, if 0 less than, e 0 strictly less than a strictly less than equal to lambda min of hk, this is the smallest eigenvalue, lambda max of hk less than equal to b, less than infinity. So if my hk, the minimum eigenvalue of hk is strictly positive for all k, and it's strictly bounded from below by some positive real number a, and the maximum eigenvalue of hk is bounded from above by a real number b, which is strictly finite, then then xk converges to a stationary point. point of fx plus cpx. Yes? A and B is not in the equation. This is a hypothesis that the minimum value, minimum eigenvalue of hk is strictly positive and maximum eigenvalue of hk is is finite. So you shouldn't have that as you are running the iteration, one of the eigenvalues of HK is going to zero. So HK is still positive definite, but it's going to zero. Like, uh, like your HK could be one over K times identity. It's a positive definite, but the eigenvalues are going to zero. So we don't want to have that situation here. We want to avoid that case. So that's why this assumption is there.
Uh, actually, I want to modify the statement a little bit. Uh, if and xk converges to x star, so your algorithm is converging, then x star is a stationary point of fx plus cpx. Yeah. <coughs> so if this hypothesis is satisfied and your algorithm converges, then the point to which it converges is a stationary point of fx plus cpx. Now, if everything was convex, which is f of x is convex, g of x is convex, then fx plus cpx is a convex function and so x star would be a global minimum of the convex function and therefore x star would be the optimal solution to the original optimization problem. But that is under the assumption that everything is convex. If things are not convex, then all you converse to is a stationary point and hopefully it, is, it gives you a good, reasonably good solution for your original optimization problem. Any questions on this result? So this is a result on sequential quadratic program. We still have to talk about two things, which is how do you pick C, the C, and how do you pick HK? Those are the two things we are still missing right now. Questions? No? Okay. So let's talk about C. What do you think? How would you? So, so, so this is the question. Let me pose this question to you. I'm sitting at x naught. I have this number. I've picked h naught to be some identity matrix, let's say. I have all these constraints. That's fine. I don't know the value of C. So what should I do? I don't know the value of C. How can I estimate the value of C? How do I estimate the value of C in the beginning? So one situation could be that you have ran this optimization a million times in the past. So you kind of sort of know what value of C you should pick based on your experience. But I'm talking about a situation where you have no experience. This is the first time you're implementing this algorithm. So here is an idea of how to estimate the value of C. Uh, at k equals to zero, solve min D in Rn gradient of fx naught transpose d plus half d transpose h naught d such that gj of x naught plus gradient of gj of x naught transpose d less than equal to zero. So I will solve this expression and get mu 0, 1, mu 0, 2, mu 0, r for this constrained optimization problem. So you got these numbers, mu 0 to mu r, for this constrained optimization problem. So there is no c here. This c term is missing, and c is set to be equal to 0. So I'm not optimizing over c. I'm only optimizing over d. 
I get the solution to this and I compute the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the optimal solution here. And then I'm going to pick C, uh, C1, let me say C1 to be summation of mu zero j, j equals one to r plus some positive number gamma. So I'm going to pick a very large, I mean not very large, I'm going to estimate the value of C1 using that particular uh, approach at time zero and then I'll go back to time one and so on and I will put CK here where CK is constantly changing according to this particular well I should write the update for CK here is the update for CK. So CK plus 1 equals to max of CK and then summation of mu KJ J equals 1 to R plus gamma. That's how I'll update my CK at every step. Okay, yes, please. Suppose that uh, like I am assuming the value of CK. Yes. And so it's less than the summation of mu j. Right. Um, so, you know, we are talking a lot about the uh, convergence stuff. So, your convergence will become very slow if you are, or, or you may be, you need to move towards the optimal point. You have picked the value of C to be small than the summation of something, summation of the Lagrange multipliers. So in that situation, instead of going towards the optimal point, you are going to wander around here and there. Okay, you will still move towards the optimal point, but you are just sort of wandering around a lot, which is going to slow down your convergence significantly. So, and you don't want that to happen. You don't want to slow down your convergence which is why you need to continue to update CK as long as it's sufficiently high, then you are in good shape, okay? The other thing that you will notice is uh, eventually, as you get closer and closer to the optimal solution, the value of DK is going to become smaller and smaller. When the value of DK is small, this is what you should expect. If norm of dk is small, then mu kj is approximately equal to mu j star. Okay, so if you are consistently seeing a small value of dk, you can just switch to c to be equal to summation of mu kj plus gamma. So towards the beginning of the iteration, you are updating CK according to this fashion. Towards the end of the iteration, you just pick a value of CK which is large, which is uh, the sum of the Lagrange multipliers plus some positive offset. This gamma has to be positive. and you should be fine. You should converge to the optimal solution in that case. So we have mitigated another unknown, which is C in this expression. So it's like starting with uh, an initial C of 
zero. Right. <coughs> That's right. You keep updating. And then at some point of time, you will start seeing that the norm of dk is small. In which case, instead of using this update equation, you pick this update equation. Because you expect, so when norm of d is small, you expect this approximation to hold. So therefore, you will just add a positive offset. And you will try to update CK according to this fashion. Just <laughs> trial and error. <Okay. laughs> yeah. Okay. And now the third thing that we wanted to talk. Any other questions about the update of CK? Yes, please. Right. So if you pick very large value of CK, so let's, good question. So let's think about it. So I have picked the very large value of C here. Okay. Then the function is a very small component of the objective function that you are trying to minimize. Right. Because this C is large, so you are basically putting a lot more weight on the penalty and very little weight on your original optimization problem, original objective function. So what you will end up doing is you will, you will effectively minimize P of X. This is the problem you would be solving by picking a very large value of C. Okay? And if you minimize PX, all you get is a feasible point, a point that is within the set but not necessarily a point that is minimizing the function. You see what I'm saying? And, and that's what you want to avoid doing. You don't want to do that. So that's why the value of C has to be carefully picked when you are, when you are running these optimization problems, when you are running these optimization algorithms. Yes? Right. Correct. Our y star, which is this. Right. Which will be equal to x star. Correct. So. Do you always converge to the minimum? Yes. I'm always? Sure even if c is much, much bigger, then this condition will still be satisfied. It's still be satisfied. And so the minimum is still correct. But you don't go to the minimum. You stop your optimization algorithm at some point of time, and you output the solution. Right? So you don't want to, it's true. I mean, you know, so, so I think this is, a, this is a figure that you should always probably think about. Right? So this is a landscape f of x plus cpx. And this is the minimum point. This is your x star. But if it takes too many iterations to get to x star, you probably will stop here. This is your x 500, where you stop your iteration, which is still very far from x star. So you don't want that to happen. OK? So that's the issue. Yes, the minimum is still correct. You are correct that if c is a billion, x star is still the minimum. But you know the landscape is so flat that getting to x star requires you to run a lot of iterations. <clears throat> Any other question? Yes, please. Just to double check, once you calculate that second like, equation, once you find your C, you still use the first equation to get your C correct. Right, and you keep updating your C according to this equation. So you basically solve that equation almost twice? Uh, no, that. you just start with C1 here. So you, you start with D1. So D0 is already calculated here. Oh, I did, not, it, I did not write it. So you will get D0 as well. And so you will have x1 equals to x0 plus alpha0 D0. What you do in the first step, it's not really that important. But what you do in a subsequent steps becomes more and more important. So this is how you run the first iteration, and then you switch to this algorithm with this update equation for CK. Any other question? OK.
Okay. HK. So naturally, you can take HK to be an identity matrix. There is no problem with that. The other option is you can take HK to be the second derivative of X star and mu star, or some approximation thereof. Okay, now the problem with this approach is twofold. First, you don't know X star and mu star offhand, and you don't even know the second derivative of the Lagrangian, so how would you come up with HK? And the second problem is, this is actually, this may not be a positive definite matrix, which is why this approach is not very widely used. But suppose, this was a positive definite matrix, which would be the case if you were solving a convex problem. Then, and, and you have solved that convex problem a lot of times in the past. So you have a good approximation of the second derivative of L. Then, you are essentially getting the benefit of running a Newton's, Newton's method uh, by picking the DK where your HK is approximately equal to this term, then you are getting approximate Newton's method, which as you know is extremely fast, okay? So if you want to speed up your algorithm, if you don't want to spend too much time wandering off in order to get to the optimal solution, the way to speed up is you have to have a good approximation of the second derivative of Lagrangian at X star and mu star, which you could get from your past experience and more importantly, your HK should be a positive definite matrix. So the second derivative of L has to be a positive definite. Which would be the case if your function, your original problem was a convex problem. Then that would be satisfied. Then we don't have to worry about it. Okay. So that's how you pick HK, okay? Somehow you want to approximate the second derivative of Lagrangian at the optimal solution. Any questions so far? So this is the sequential quadratic programming method, uh, very powerful method for uh, solving optimization problems, complex optimization problems. Yes, please. Right. And you also mentioned that uh, typically you minimize this problem using manifold sub optimization. Correct. And this part. Correct. So you are never going to use microcontrollers where the state space is, where the, sorry, where the optimization is very complicated. Oh. Right? So if you are doing, right, so if you are, if think about it in this way. So you have a wind farm, which is rotate, wind turbine, which is rotating, and you have to have a microcontroller that looks at the data of what's happening at other wind turbines. Come up with an optimization problem where you, you have to optimize some two or three variables. You can use this method, because then everything is two or three dimensional object, right? Any other question? The next algorithm that we are going to talk about is Lagrangian method. Anyone remembers what method of multipliers was? So method of multipliers.
Oh, uh, let me use x lambda k, x in Rn, and lambda k plus 1 equals to C, Ck, Hxk. Okay, this was our method of multipliers approach. Method of multipliers algorithm for solving equality constrained optimization problems. How would we compute this uh, argument? Well, we are going to run a gradient descent method here. So my xk plus 1 will be, or let me write xk plus 1 j plus 1 will be, oh, j is already used. I need some other index. L. L is a good index. We have not used L, oh, L, capital, okay, so I'll make it small L, of course. <coughs> Minus alpha k x Right? This is the approach I'm going to take for solving this minimization problem. Okay. So how about I try to do the following. I come up with my own method, so I'm, I'm being very creative right now. And I look at these expressions and I'm like, okay, I have to run several of these iterations. So this L to L plus one, I probably have to run this iteration L equals to zero, one, all the way to capital L. So I have to run like capital L number of iterate. Oh, capital L is already used. Uh, some L bar. So I have to run L bar number of iterations for solving this minimization problem and then I have to update my Lagrange multiplier according to this fashion. So how about instead of doing 200 iterations here and then one iteration here, why don't I just run both the iterations simultaneously? Okay, I'm, I'm just being creative. I'm, I'm just coming up with my own algorithm. And so this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm not even going to have this augmented Lagrangian term. I'm going to run the following iteration. Xk plus one equals to Xk minus alpha. I just made my life simple and I combine these two iterations into just a one step of some set of uh, equations where I'm updating both xk and lambda k simultaneously according to some algorithm. Okay, I just pulled out that algorithm from my hat. Now, how do I know that this is a good algorithm? Well. What happens when xk and lambda k, when these two uh, vectors are converging? So if xk and lambda k converges to x bar and lambda bar, so I am running this algorithm, I picked some value of alpha, the step size, 
and I'm running this algorithm, and I see that I'm converging to some point, x bar lambda bar, what, uh, what would be the properties of this, this vector? So here is the property. My first derivative of Lagrangian will be 0. And my h of x bar will be 0. So I have if this sequence converges, then this is going to happen. Okay, so here is what is happening. I looked at the method of multipliers expression and I saw that, okay, I'm running some 200 iterations in one for loop and then I'm updating lambda k and then I'm running 200 iterations again and then I'm updating lambda k. I just find it too wasteful. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of not doing this complicated set of iterations, I'm just going to do this. Okay, very simple iteration. And the thing that I notice is if my algorithm converges to a stationary point, to a, to a point, then at that point, the first derivative of Lagrangian is zero, and h of x bar is equal to zero. What are these conditions? This is the first order necessary conditions for optimality. So I'm getting to a point which satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality. And in most problems, that is what I will get, no matter what kind of algorithm I apply. Now the question is as follows. Why should I believe that this algorithm will necessarily converge? Okay. Yes, this algorithm is inspired by this algorithm. And yes, it is also true that if the algorithm converges, then it converges to a point that satisfies first order necessary conditions for optimality. But I still don't have any reasons to believe that this algorithm is going to converge. Okay? So that's the problem we are going to study now. How do I know that this is a good algorithm? Under what conditions would it converge? Uh, so that if it converges, we are guaranteed to be at the stationary point. So let's talk about convergence of algorithms in a very, very general setting. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So I have yk plus 1 equals to h of yk. So h is a map from Rn to Rn. So I'm using Rn for x, so maybe I should use something else. R, Rk to Rk. Okay, so I'm going to map this to this problem. Oh, k is already used. What should I use here? Uh, m, m is used. Uh, m is the number of equality constraints. P. Thank you. P is not used. Yeah, P is not used. Good. So this is, h is a function from rp to rp, and I have this iteration yk plus 1 equals to h of yk. So mapping it to those set of equations, I have yk equals to xk and lambda k, and I have h of yk equals to
So I have, a, I have a map H, capital H, and I'm iteratively applying that map to YK. I mean, so I start from some Y0, which is arbitrary, and then I'm applying this map H to get this iteration, this sequence YK. So the question is, under what conditions would this sequence converge, right? That's the question we are asking. Under what conditions is the sequence going to converge to a point? This problem is actually a very, very important problem in the field of mathematics. Under what conditions iterative schemes converges? So it's an important problem in mathematics and there are a few tools available for us to use to figure out what should we assume about H so that the sequence converges. But there's one tool that sort of stands out, which is the Banach contraction mapping theorem. And that's what we will talk about in the next class, which of course on Friday there is no class, so I'll be recording the lecture and uploading it. Uh, but that's what we will talk about in Banach contraction mapping theorem. But here is the result which is a consequence of contraction mapping theorem. So let me tell you what the result is. Suppose there exists a point Y star such that H of Y star equals to Y star. Assume, I think there is only one assumption. Assume that the spectral radius of the first derivative of H at Y star is less than one. Then there exists a neighborhood, neighborhood of Y star such that if Y naught belongs to neighborhood capital N of Y star such that if Y naught belongs to N, then YK converges to Y star. Okay, so what is happening here? I have a function h that maps rp to rp and I'm starting from y0, I have generated a sequence yk. Now here is the hypothesis. So this is my space. Uh, let me, I mean the entire blackboard is my space rp. And I have a point Y star that is in RP. This is my space RP. And at Y star, H of Y star is equal to Y star. So this is known as a fixed point of H. So Y star is a fixed point of H, which is equivalent to saying that Y star is equal to H of Y star. Now I'm going to make an assumption that if I take the first derivative of H, evaluate it at Y star, look at the spectral radius of that matrix, it's less than one, okay? The spectral radius of that matrix is less than one. Then there exists a neighborhood N of Y star 
so this is my neighborhood this is my neighborhood n of y star such that if I pick any y naught in n if I pick my y naught here within n and I generate this sequence yk plus 1 equals to hyk I'm going to converse to y star uh, as k goes to infinity so this is my h of y naught this is my h of h square of y naught h cube of y naught h raised to 4 of y naught and so on this is my y1 y2 y3 y4 and so on I'm going to converge to y star uh, by iteratively applying the same function h over and over again Okay. So I have my y star which is a fixed point of h I know that the, as, by assumption the spectral radius of the gradient of h at y star is less than 1 then there exists a neighborhood capital N which encompasses y star so y star is in the interior of this neighborhood capital N such that if I start from any point within this set capital N and I iteratively apply this h of y naught uh, eventually I the if I iteratively apply this function h I am going to converge to y star in the limit now this is the powerful theorem that you can use to show that the Lagrangian method that we came up with converges to an optimal solution converges to a stationary point not an optimal solution okay it converges to a point that satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality now let's see how we can apply this result to the problem that we have which is the Lagrangian method the set of equations that we came up with uh, any questions on this one I'm going to erase this side of the board okay all right so I have my h of y which is this particular expression so what is my gradient of h of y so that would be identity well I shouldn't write y gradient of h of x and lambda so that is identity minus alpha second derivative gradient of h at x minus gradient of h of x and 0 let me put star here because that's what I care about So I know that x star lambda star is a fixed point of this expression. Uh, I don't know what the spectral radius of this matrix gradient of h is going to look like. Okay, but I do know that the gradient of h evaluated at x star lambda star looks like this. Okay, so here alpha is greater than zero, 
step size. And I have complete freedom to pick whatever step size I am I'm happy with. And I have this matrix capital B, which is whatever that matrix is. Okay? Second derivative of L, gradient of H, minus gradient of H. There should be a transpose somewhere. Let me check where the, oh, it's in the second row. There is a transpose here. So gradient of x minus gradient of h x star transpose 0. OK. Now, what do we know? So a fact. So the let lambda 1 to lambda n or lambda p lambda m plus n be the eigenvalues of b, then If second derivative of the Lagrangian is strictly positive, no, is, is a positive definite matrix, then the real part of lambda i is greater than 0. So the real part of the eigenvalue of p is greater than 0 for all i. OK. So I came up with a method, a uh, Lagrangian method. And I want to use that theorem to show that the method that I came up with converges to a stationary point of the optimization problem. In order to use the theorem, the first assumption is satisfied. The second assumption is what we want to satisfy so that I can get the convergence result. Uh, I realized by looking at the first derivative of h that I get this sort of uh, i minus alpha b kind of term. And then I did some more analysis for this matrix b and I found out that if the second derivative of Lagrangian, if this matrix here is positive definite, then real value of lambda i is strictly positive. That, that is the real value of the eigenvalues of this matrix is strictly positive. What this allows us to do is come up with a step size which is sufficiently small so that the derivative, the first derivative of h at x star lambda star is strictly less than 1. That's because of this particular result. So this implies there exists a step size alpha greater than 0 such that rho of i minus alpha b is strictly less than 1. Alpha has to be small, but you can pick a positive and small value of alpha so that this condition is satisfied. Okay, you can, you can make the spectral radius of this matrix small. Then this condition would be satisfied. The spectral radius of gradient of h at y star will be less than 1. And then if you start close to y star, your iterations would converge to the, the point that satisfies first order necessary conditions for optimality. So this is a general method for proving that whatever optimization method you dreamed up in your dreams actually said satisfies, uh, actually converges to the optimal solution. Okay, it's a very, very important result in the optimization theory. And almost, um, 
If you go back to the optimization literature, a majority of the algorithms would be appealing to this particular result for proving convergence of the algorithm. Right? Of course, in this class, we don't care about convergence of algorithms. But it is an important topic, and this result allows us to conclude that. So we'll talk more about it by studying Banach contraction mapping theorem and studying how it applies to various other problems. So we'll talk about that in the subsequent classes. Thank you for your attention. And the office hours is going to start right after this class. So please come to my office hours if you need any help.